and we're welcome to the service tonight. I'm going to ask if you would like some of you that maybe are down in the fire to move up if you, if you want to. Uh, we haven't got a big fire in the night. It's on our fear and dread the cold, I think. And of course, it is Valentine's Day. So we expect the sun not to be here because of that. But it's good to see those of you that are here. And we came to worship the Lord. Amen. We are going to go directly to prayer and to uh, ask the Lord to bless the service, of course, but also to touch people's lives. And, and those that are sick, and those that couldn't make it out, there are those that are shut in, and there are various sicknesses. I don't have a list before, and I will my prayer for you. The key king was in hospital, too. We had an iron attack for this for Pastor Shannon. And so we want to keep Keith in our prayers as well. There's many other needs, many that are here, uh, many that we're well aware of. There's needs out there, I'm sure, people that are watching on the lawn. God sees where you are and what's needed in your life. The most important, of course, is salvation, and being in the right relationship with him. Amen. Through his son Jesus. So we're going to take this time to go to prayer, and Pastor Lamar is going to lead us in worship tonight. I ask you to bow with me. Lord, we thank you for this day again. Lord, we thank you for this night. We thank you for this service, Lord. We thank you that you're with us and that you're covering us, O oh God, and your spirit has empowered us, O oh God, for such a time as this, O oh God, to do the work of the ministry. So that's what you've asked us to do, O oh God, and we will go forth as ambassadors in Christ's stead, Lord. That's what you told us, Lord, in your word beseeching people to be reconciled to you, Father. So I pray, God, that this night, O oh God, people will be reconciled to you, that they will come into relationship with you, O oh God, and that they will find that they're in that place, O oh God, where all their sins are forgiven, and that they're in that place of mercy and grace, O oh God, in the comfort of your loving arms. So, Lord, we just pray your will will be done in this place tonight upon the musicians, upon, O oh God, Pastor Shannon, as he brings your word, O oh God, we pray a rich anointing, O God, and great yokes, O Lord, that the power of your spirit would do the work, Lord. And you see those that are sick. You see those that are shut in. You see those that are watching online, O God. And if they're finding themselves in iron situations, maybe they're going through a storm or a battle, O God, or, or something's going on in their lives, O God, that they haven't been able to share with someone else. But Lord, you're there for them. You understand where they are. So I just pray you would minister to them. And I just pray, O oh God, they would see you, O oh God, in your love, and in your mercy, and in your sovereignty, O oh God, and in your providence, Lord, and how you work things out for our good, O oh God. It's just you tell us in your word, O oh God, that all things work together for good to them who love you, to them who are called according to your purpose, to those who put their trust in you, O oh God. You're working all the things for our good, O oh God, because you're a good God. Lord. So I just pray your hand upon each and every one, O oh Lord, that you would heal. We pray for Keith, O oh Lord, that your hand will be upon him. I pray you will give him a speedy recovery and that everything will be fine, O oh God. And you will surround this family, O oh Lord, and around all the families, O oh God, who have needs. Or mourning loss of loved ones, O oh God, or those who struggles, Lord. I just pray your divine aim, your divine touch upon their lives, and that your divine will will be accomplished in this service tonight. As we know you have a divine will, even for us who are here, O oh God, you have a purpose for us in gathering together. So just have your way. And I pray whatever your purpose is, O oh God, will be completed. And as souls will come to you, O oh God, and people will be touched mightily by your spirit. And we ask it in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 May God bless you.
praise you, Lord. Praise you, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. You're worthy, Lord. Hallelujah.
If you're here tonight and you're already in relationship with the Lord, let this sound be an encouragement to you. That same spirit that rose Christ from the dead empowers you and quickens your mortal body tonight to do all that he asks of you, all that you're called to do tonight. We're going to stand all over this place before the pastor comes with the word and we're going to sing that as an end for tonight. I believe that he is Lord. Jesus Christ, the second person of the Trinity, he is Lord. And tonight, more than that, he's my Lord. If he's your Lord tonight, that's something to rejoice about. If you're outside of a relationship tonight, that's something to think about. You need to make him your Lord while there's still time tonight.
on every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ, that He is the Lord. Amen. That's the truth of His Word, and it will be a reality someday. Uh, praise the Lord. We do have some slides. We'll ask Trevor if he can put them up for us. Amen. First, let me say happy Valentine's Day to you. Amen. It's good to see you at the church on Valentine's evening. Amen. I'm sure there's other places you could have been. Uh, but thank you for coming to the house of the Lord. The title of our message tonight is The Love of God. Uh, the Love of God. No better topic, no better sermon to preach on a Valentine's Friday evening and then the love of God. I love my wife this morning. She rose and woke. She had a dozen roses when she woke up. That's because I love her. But you know something? There's one who loves her more than me. One that loves her more than her mom and her dad. And his name is Jesus. God in heaven. Amen. Who loves you, loves me, cares about us, cares about humanity, cares about our community, cares about what's happening in your life. Some people feel so disconnected and feel like nobody understands or nobody cares and they, and they feel like God is way out there somewhere. But hear me tonight, God cares about you. In fact, He loves you with a passion that I cannot do justice in describing. The truth tonight is without the love of God, I don't know where I would be and I don't know where you would be. I would probably be gone out into a lost eternity. That's the truth. If it was not for the love of God and the times that He spared my life when I was out in sin and doing things I should not have been doing, but the Lord spared my life because He loved me, because He cared about me. Others of you maybe tonight have gone through sickness and have gone through valleys of much sickness, but you know what? You're still here tonight. Why are you still here? You're here because God loves you, because God cares about you, because God is concerned about you. And that he walked with you as you went through that valley experience. He never left me. He never forsook me. Even when I was away from him. Living in sin and living in rebellion. Because of his love. He still even then did not abandon me. Even though I abandoned him. And walked away from him. And went down paths and roads that I ought not to have gone down. But the Lord's love was still there. His passion had not changed towards me. The love of God. Without the love of Jesus Christ, without the love of my Lord and Savior, where would you be tonight? Well, one place we would be would be lost in sin. For the truth is there would be no hope for us if it was not for the love of Jesus Christ our Lord and of our Savior. Amen. Before you got seen, before I got seen, before we entered into relationship with our God, He was pursuing us, He was seeking after us, He was revealing Himself to us through His Word, through preachers, through family, through friends, maybe through a spouse or whatever the case may be, but He was reaching out to you and drawing you in because of His love and His passion for you. There's not one of us here tonight, <coughs> not one of us here tonight, who deserve the love of God. That's the truth. Not one of us, not even the preacher. There's not one of us here tonight who deserve the love of God, who deserve the, the mercy of God and the compassion of God, yet He still loves us. Look what Lamentations chapter 3 says in verse number 22. It says, because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed. If it was not for the love of Jesus Christ, I'd be lost in my sin. I would be consumed. I would receive eternal damnation. But that's not my story tonight, because somebody loved me. And his name is Jesus. For his compassion, the compassion of God, you want to know something? It never fails. Have anybody ever failed you? Well, I can guarantee you people have failed you. I have failed people as their pastor. As a church, we have failed people sometimes. But there's one that never fails, and his name is Jesus. The one that loves me, the one that cares about me, the one who loves you tonight, the one who cares about you, he is never failing. His compassion is never failing. They are new every morning, and great, O oh Lord, great is your faithfulness. It is because of the love of God that we are not consumed. Here's one of my favorite psalms. I've read it many times, preached from it several times uh, since I've been in Bible Vista. But let's look at just uh, three or four verses out of this wonderful chapter. Psalm 103, verse number 8, says what? The Lord is compassionate. Well, the Lord is a judge, and the Lord and the Lord is, is coming to judge people because of their sin and all of these things. This is true. But know this, that the Lord is compassionate. 
It's not his desire that you would be eternally separated from him. It is his desire that you would that you would walk in relationship and fellowship with him. It is his desire that you would accept his sacrifice and his love unto you. The Lord is compassionate and he is gracious and he is slow to anger. And you know something? He is abounding in love. Abounding in love. In fact, God is love, the scripture says. He is abounding in love. He will not always accuse, nor will he ever his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve. Or repay us according to our iniquities. That doesn't mean that everybody gets to go to heaven. That's not what the verse is saying. But the verse says, he doesn't treat me like I deserve. You know what I deserve? I deserve to be eternally separated from God. I deserve to be cast into the regions of the damned. But because of the Lord's mercy, but because of the Lord's grace, He continued to reach out unto me. He continued to reveal Himself unto me until that time came when I confessed Him as my Lord and as my Savior. I didn't deserve that. And so He doesn't repay me according to my iniquities. Instead, as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is His love for me and His love for you and for all who would fear Him. The love of of God. The Lord God this evening loves you and He cares for you and He's proven His love for us in this, in the fact that over 2,000 years ago He went to a cross and He died and He laid on His life so that we could be saved. How can such a loving God judge the world? How can such a loving God allow war and allow violence and allow cancer and allow all of the injustice and all of the atrocities that we see in our world? The truth is that it is humanity and it is the sinful nature of humanity that has caused the things that we see around us. But God has made a way. God has made a way that we can be redeemed. God has made a way that we can be saved. God has made a way that we can become His family and become the children of God. He demonstrates us His love, rather. He demonstrates His love for us in this. And while we were still sinners, Jesus died for me. While I was still out there doing what I was doing and living the way that I was living, Jesus Christ hung on a cross all those years ago and He did it for me and He did it for you. There's so many that feel worthless and so many feel like they don't have anything to offer or feel like that they're, they're not good enough to serve the Lord or not good enough to, to walk in relationship with, the, with God. But He demonstrates His love for you in this that while you are still in your sins, He laid down His life for you. Why? Because He loves you and He cares about you and He is passionate about you. He is concerned about you. He wants to redeem you. He wants to lift you into that pit of sin and muck and mire. He wants to place your feet upon a firm foundation, upon a solid rock. The Lord Jesus loves you and I know that He loves you and I know that He loves me because He didn't say, change your life and then I would die for you. He didn't say, give that up and then I will love you. No, I was still involved in these things. In fact, the scripture says I was born in sin and shape and iniquity. But yet, in spite of all of that, Jesus hung on a cross and redeemed me and saved me and set me free. I know that Jesus loves me because he died for me with all of my flaws, with all of my mistakes, with all of my, my insecurities and all. I know that Jesus loves me because he died for me. I know that God loves you tonight because he died for me. <coughs> yes, you may not be perfect. Guess what? There's none of us that are. There's only one that's perfect and his name is Jesus. But God loves you and God cares about you and he's concerned about you. This Valentine's Friday evening, know this, uh, there's one that loves you more than your Valentine, one that loves you more than even your parents, uh, and his name is Jesus. Uh, he is passionate about you uh, and he's concerned about you. Uh, for the scripture says that God son of the world. I love this verse. It's been preached so many times. But God so loved the world that includes you, that includes me, that includes the man and woman up the street, it includes the drunkard in the club tonight, it includes every man, woman, and child ever born upon the face of the earth. For God so loved the world that He gave the best Valentine that has ever been given. Better than a little, a little heart. Better than a, and than a sweetheart. Better than a dozen roses this, this evening. For God so loved the world that He gave His one and His only Son that whoever believes in Him shall not perish. 
but have eternal life. He stands at the door and he knocks at the door and waits for you to open the door, presents unto you a valentine. The, 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 the decision is yours whether to accept it or to reject it, but out of his great love and out of his great compassion, he offers unto you a love letter. He offers unto you freedom. He offers unto you compassion. He offers unto you mercy. I love verse number 17 as well. We often read John 3 and 16 and we, and we forget about verse 17. But it says, For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through Him. God, as I said, I believe this past Sunday, God didn't send His Son into the world to condemn you or to make you feel guilty or to put all these rules upon you. But God sent His, word, His Son into this world that you might be saved and that you might be free and that you you might know what it is to, to experience true love and true acceptance. Yes, there's things that you will change and there's rules that you will follow and there's places you won't go anymore, but it's not because God said that you need to do these things or you'll be under condemnation, but it's because He set you free and because He loves you and because He cares about you, and so you'll follow Him and you'll live for Him and you'll practice the principles of His Word. You see, the truth is, I'm not saved because I don't go to the club no more. I'm not saved because I don't roll up that tote no more. That's not what saved my soul. What saved my soul was some years ago. I said, Jesus, come into my heart and come into my life and forgive me of my sin. I accepted his love, Valentine. And he forgave me. And he saved me. And so from that moment on, yes, there's some things I changed in my life. Uh, but it wasn't those things that saved me. It was my faith uh, in accepting his sacrifice. Uh, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, uh, but to save the world through him. Uh, and so I have freedom and hope and joy and peace uh, and love and all of these things to save me. All because God offered unto me a grace. God offered unto me a gift. Uh, God offered unto me salvation. For it is by grace, Paul writes to the Ephesians, it is by grace that you have been saved through faith. And this is not of yourselves, but it is a gift of God. You see, I didn't earn it. I couldn't go get all pretty and put on my lipstick and all of that. I'm not going to put on lipstick, all right? You know what it's like on Valentine's. Let's go all dressed up. Let's go out. Let's go out to dinner. Let's have candles. Let's have roses. Let's have all these things. Let's get all, let's get all pretty. But you see, it was not in myself. It was not in myself that I made myself look all pretty to God or look all clean to God. No. There was no amount of suits I could put on or ties I could put on or offerings I could give or church services I could attend. It was through His grace and through His mercy. It was through that Valentine, that free gift that He offered unto me that I am saved and that I am redeemed. The yeah. God of creation, the God of Adam, Isaac, and Jacob. The God, the one and only true God, the, the loving God. It is through Him and His sacrifice that I have been changed and it's something that happened on the inside and yes, there was evidence of it on the outside as well in the way that I live and the things that I do. But truly, it was a miracle that happened on the inside. It happened in this heart of mine that Jesus Christ came and brought about a change. He showed unto me grace and mercy and love like nobody could show unto me grace and mercy and love. And because of His love, I love Him. And because of His love, I love you. And because of His love, I love my neighbor. And because of His love, I even love my enemies. But it's the change that He brought because of His love unto me. Is love important? You better believe love is important. Valentine's reminds us that love is important. In fact, this is a command of God Himself. In John chapter 3, verse 34, Jesus says, A new command I give you. What is this new command, Lord? What is it? It is love one another as I have loved you, for you must love one another. And by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, for if you love one another, oh, praise God, I have to love you and you have to love me. Why? Because we love Jesus. And we love Jesus, you know what? We ought to love each other. It will be a testimony to the world and to the community 
and to those around us that we belong to God. Why? Because we love them even when they say things that are not nice about us. Uh, even when they, when they do things that we think are not right uh, and they live ways that we know are not right and are contrary to the word of God. But we still love them. We still love them. We still love each other. Why? Because God loves us. And it's a command that he has given unto us. Uh, that we would love each other. Uh, that we would love each other. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. Well, how has God loved me? God has been awful patient with me. He's been awful kind towards me. He's been awful forgiving towards me. Amen. And so I ought to love you the way that Christ has loved me. I ought to be patient towards you. I have to be forgiving towards you. Yeah. I have to be kind towards you. Because that's the way God has been towards me. And so we love one another as Jesus Christ loves us. For God loves me so much that he gave all that he could give for me. What is the greatest command? It's what Jesus was asked in Matthew chapter 22 by the Pharisees. And so he replied, here's the greatest command. Love the Lord your God with what? Half of your heart. Love the Lord on Sunday. That's not what the Word of God says. For the Word of God says, Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like unto it. I am to love you, and that you are to love me. I need to love God, but yes, I also need to love my neighbor. It is a love story. This, this wonderful gospel message is a love story. The Lord loves me, and he loves you, and he has changed us. He has changed our hearts, and there ought to be evidence of that in the way that we treat each other, and the way that we treat our neighbors, and the patience that we have with one another, and the compassion that we have towards each other. I love you. I hope you love me. Amen. Because the Lord loves us all. Amen. I want to look at a wonderful story in the scripture. I've preached from this text since I've been here before. We're going to look at it again tonight. It's the story of the Good Samaritan. It's a story of love. It's a story of a man who takes time to help somebody who is in need. Who doesn't just walk past. Who doesn't just ignore the situation. But offers on to him compassion. And offers on to him love. So let's look at it together. In Luke chapter 10, verse number 25. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up and tested Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What must I do to be saved? And so Luke is the same account that we just uh, read in Matthew. It says, what, what is written in the law? He replied, how do you read it? And he answered, the Pharisee, Love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul and with all of your strength and with all of your mind and love your neighbor as yourself, the Pharisee said. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live or you will be saved is what the scripture is saying. But he wanted to justify himself and so he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Is that man that lives that way up the road, is he my neighbor? Is that woman who lives over there and lives that way, is she my neighbor? Is he one that justify himself in his own, his own religious state and his own self-righteousness? So Jesus begins to unfold a paragraph. In reply, Jesus said, a, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. When he fell into the hands of robbers, and they stripped him of his clothes and beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. There are many in our community tonight in the spiritual sense that have been beaten, that have been robbed, that have been abused by the enemy of their souls and they feel trapped and they feel helpless and they feel no one loves them and no one cares about them. But it's not what the scripture teaches because there is one that cares. But a priest happened to be going down the same road. And when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too a Levite. When he came to the place and saw him, he passed by on the other side as well. Then it says, but a Samaritan. As he traveled, he came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He saw this man who was bleeding, who was dying on Jericho's road. You know what? He had compassion within his heart. He had love within his heart. And so the scripture says that he went to him and he bandaged his wounds and he poured on the oil and the wine. Are you thankful for what Jesus Christ did when you were bleeding and dying on Jericho's road? Amen. He came and he poured on the oil and the wine. Bandage up your wounds. 
wounds. Amen. Is that not what the scripture says? Uh, that he comes to heal the broken heart and to bind the wounds? For that is who my Lord and Savior is. And so it says that he poured in the oil and the wine. And when he put the man, or then he put the man on his own donkey. And took him to the end and he took care of him. And the next day he took out two silver coins and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said. And when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense that you have, the scripture says. And then which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? And the expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. And Jesus told him to go and to do likewise. And so Jesus told him to go. Basically what he's saying is go and love your neighbor. Go and be compassionate to your neighbor. Go and be kind to your neighbor. Go and show the love of God through the way that you act towards your neighbor, towards your friend, towards the one who sits next to you in church, or the one that works next to you in the fish plant or in the hospital or, or on the job site, or wherever it is that you find yourself. For it is a new command that the Lord gives us, I just read to you. What is the command of the Lord? Not a suggestion. That we would love people the way that God loves us. That we would treat people the way that God treats us. Does God turn the blind eye? Does God look away and say, and say oh, he's too dirty. He's too stinky. Uh, uh, he's, he's involved in all kinds of, of sin. And he's involved in all kinds of things that are unholy and ungodly. And so I'll, uh, so I'll leave him there dying and bleeding on Jericho's road. That's not what the Lord said. And that's not what the Lord did. Because I was like that man who was bleeding and dying and, and there was no doubt was a stench in the nostrils of my God because of my unholiness and my wickedness. But God looked at me through a prism of compassion and love and grace and mercy. And so he stopped and he reached into my heart and reached into my life and revealed himself unto me. Saved me and he redeemed me and he cares about me and he had purpose for me. That's hard for me to fathom at times. Hard for me to comprehend even now as a pastor that God saw value in me. Not only to redeem me and to save me, but he wanted me to be a part of his kingdom and a part of his church. And he saw that I had a value in the future for his kingdom. I had teachers tell me I was worthless. I had teachers tell me I would amount to nothing. But God saw more into me than my teachers could see into me. Guess what? God sees more into you tonight than, than anybody else could see into you. He has value in you. He, he sees value in you. And there is hope for you. And God desires to work in you and not only in you, but through you. You see, there's one that loves you. There's one that cares about you. Ah, point number one, and I only have two points, uh, is this, that love can be lacking in religious people. Has anybody seen it? Has anybody experienced it? Absolutely. Love can be lacking in religious people. Uh, I've even experienced it in my own teenage years. I shared this story with Pastor Corey a while ago. I was, I was one time in youth group, and uh, of course I didn't grow up in church, and I had the long mullet and the hat and all of these things and the leather jacket and, and smoked dope and all of these things. But I, I wound up in youth group one night. I don't know what I was, maybe 15, 16 years old. And I had this hat on, baseball hat on all day in school and all that. I had the long hair and all that. And I came into church and, and the youth pastor come down and told me, listen, you can't, you can't come into church with your hat on. You can't stay in church with your hat on. And I didn't know, know a lot about the gospel, but guess what? I wouldn't want to take my hat off. I wasn't going to take my hat off. I had all this hair and all these girls around the work, so what I do is I walk through the church. I left. I thought about that. How many times have I thought about that? What if I never came back into church? What if I never ever walked inside the doors again because somebody kicked me to church because I had a hat on? What if I was lost in a million years and a million years and I was burning in an eternal flame? Because I walked into a church because somebody said you're not welcome here because you got a hat on. Mm. Love can be lacking sometimes in religious people. Sometimes we can be a little bit too zealous. Should you have respect for the house of the Lord? Absolutely. Should you have respect for the house of the Lord? Absolutely. When I was a young man that didn't even know much about God, my soul weighed in the balance. I needed love. I needed compassion. I needed acceptance. I needed somebody to teach me. 
I need somebody to explain to me. I need someone to be patient with me. You know what? Some years later, I found there was one that was patient, and his name is Jesus. Hallelujah. Because I still, I didn't put the baseball hat on, but I still made mistakes. I still got angry at times, and I still said things maybe I shouldn't have said, or, or maybe even times went places I shouldn't have went in my first beginning times as, as a new believer in Jesus Christ, because I didn't understand it all. Well, I found there was one that was gracious. I found there was one that was patient. And his name is Jesus. But the first thing I notice about this, this story that we, that we just read, uh, this story of the Good Samaritan, is that this teacher of the law, that this Pharisee came, came to Jesus and to test him. He begins to quote the scripture. He quoted Deuteronomy 6 and 5. He knew the scripture. And that's what he was quoting when he said, Love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul, with all of your mind, with all of your strength. And, and then he says, And love your neighbor as yourself. This man knew the scripture. He was a religious man. He knew the scripture. But did he really love God the way that he should have loved God? Did he really love his neighbor the way that he should have loved his neighbor? I'll leave that between him and between God when he... But the way the story is told, that, that he was lacking in some areas of his life, uh, though he was a teacher of the law, and though he knew the scriptures, uh, uh, there's one thing to be religious, but there's another thing to walk in faith, uh, and to walk in relationship with Jesus Christ. Uh, you see, when I walked in that all for all of those years ago, you want to know something? I didn't become religious. But I did enter into a relationship with my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Oh, yes, I didn't become a Pharisee and I didn't become under the law, but I came under grace and, and I'm learning and I'm growing and I'm getting closer to God. Even now as a pastor, I'm still learning and growing and getting closer to God all the time. I started out as a little babe in Christ. Now I'm mature and I'm growing. You know what? God loves and God cares and God is compassionate. He doesn't want us to be religious, but He wants us to walk in faith and He wants us to walk in obedience and He wants us to walk in relationship with Him. It was Jesus Christ that changed my heart and changed my life. It is Him that offered unto me love. And because of what He has done for me, I will treat others differently than I did before. First John, First John chapter number 4 says this. We love because He, Jesus, God, we love because He first loved us. Whoever claims to love God yet hates his brother or sister is a liar. Did your mom or dad ever tell you to never call anybody a liar? Mine did. It's very rude. You shouldn't call people a liar. Here's the word of the Lord. Whoever claims to love God yet hates his brother or sister is a liar, for whoever does not love their brother and sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. Is love important? You better believe love is important. How I treat you, is that important? You better believe that is important. How I treat my neighbor and treat those out there in the community that maybe do not love and live the way that I live and may not be serving God the way that I'm serving God, you better believe it is important. And as he has given us this command, or rather, and he has given us this command, everyone who loves God must also love their brother and love their sister. Again, you get the word command, and there's not an option, and there's not a choice in that. I had to love you, and you have to love me, because God loves us. And he's changed our hearts, and he's changed our lives, and that ought to change the way we treat each other, and certainly the way we treat those out in our community, and those that are around us. God's love changes lives. Oh, God's love changes lives. His love changed my life. And now you know what? I'm his hands. I'm his feet. I'm his mouth. I'm his eyes. We are the body of Christ. And the love of God changes lives. And so we representing God and representing Jesus and because of who he is and what he has done in us we now allow him to work through us and love through us and show compassion through us and show patience through us that we love people and we care about people and that we are concerned about people amen love can be lacking in religious people at times and that is true but understand this Understand the love of God that it changes things and it changes circumstances and it changes situations.
situations, uh, and it changed a sinner like me. Ah, uh, if you knew me when I was in my teenage years, you find it hard to believe I was up for preaching. You, you probably agree with my teachers. Yes, very disrespectful. Not a lot of love for my neighbor, but you want to know something? Jesus Christ loved me, and he cared about me, and he changed me, and it changes the way that I treat others as well. For it is by grace that you have been saved through faith, and this not of yourselves, but a gift of God, which is read a few moments ago. It is, by, it is not by works, so that no one can boast, for we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. You see, God doesn't only save you so you can come to church and worship and come to church and, and serve Him, but God changes so that you can do good works. So that you can represent him. So that you can love your neighbor in his place. Representing him. Being his ambassador. Being his children. Being his hands and his feet in our community. Loving people. Loving each other. Yes, there was dis disagreements. Yes, there were times when we don't see eye to eye as, the, as brothers and sisters of the faith. But that ought not to change my love for you. It ought not to change your love for me. Because we are united in the fact that we are brought together and we're a part of one family. We are a part of the family of God. Amen. Point number two, and I only have two points tonight, is this. Uh, that love means getting involved. Love means that I need to get involved. For we are God's handy. We're created in Christ Jesus to do good works. To get involved in the work of the Lord. There's a work that needs to be done. There's a work for you to do. There's a work for me to do. There's a work for us to do as a church. There's a community. There's communities around us that need to experience the love of God. You see, love is an action word. Love is an action word. I can say I love you, but if I don't do anything, then do I really love you? I can say that I love my wife, but I never kiss her, never hold her hand. Never tell her that I, that I love her. I never show her that I love her. It's just, it's just lip service. Well, this morning I wasted the I didn't say that. This morning I spent some money on a dozen roses. That would mean nothing. She tore the roses in the garbage. <laughs> never know what you're going to say. This morning I bought some roses. Twelve beautiful roses. But you would know why I did it. Because just saying I love you or happy Valentine's Day doesn't mean a lot. I wanted her to know. I wanted to show her that I love her. And so I didn't waste some money. I invested, I invested some money in our relationship. <laughs> oh, praise God. <laughs> but love is an action word. I can say I love you all day long and then be nothing but cantankerous and the worst husband ever was put in a marriage. Or I can show that I love her. Show her that I love her. Amen. Be kind. Be compassionate. And she can do the same for me. Love is an action word. I love God, so what do I do? I come to church and I, and I fold my hands and, and, I, and I look around and, and then I get up at the end of the service and I go home. No, love is an action word. I love God, so you know what I do? I worship the Lord. I sing the songs. I raise my hands. I close my eyes. I focus upon Him. I concentrate upon Him. And I give Him the worship and praise that's due unto His name. Because I love you, Lord. Yeah. So there's an action. An action behind what is happening. I love God, so what do I do? I put on my pants and my shirt and my, my suit jacket. And I go up to church on Valentine's night with the wind gusts 170 and minus 25 wind chill. That's what it's like after tonight. But you want to know something? I love God. And I not only do I love God, but I love my community. And so we want to have these services. And so I get ready and I go up to church because I love God. Where should you find yourself on a Sunday morning or a Sunday evening? You love God. You're, you're followers of God. Where should you be? You should be in the house of the Lord. Because love is action. Love is not just lip service. Love is not just saying, I love God. Don't go to church, don't pray, don't read the Bible, don't follow His Word. But I love God. No, love God is an action word. It means I follow God. I do what His Word tells me and asks me to do. And, and I go to the house of God and I worship the Lord. Love God means to follow the teachings of His Word. For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son. 
See, God loved the world. That's great. God loved the world. He created us. But then he put some action behind it. And he gave. He gave, as I've already said, the, the best valentine that has ever been given. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and his only son. There was action behind it. Because love is an action word. Hallelujah. Love my neighbor. What does that mean? Well, I love my neighbor. That means I ought to be praying for my neighbor. I have to be praying for the salvation of their soul on a regular basis. I love my family, so I pray for my family. I love my neighbor, so I pray for my neighbor. I, I, love, I even love my enemy, so what do I do? I pray for my enemies. I love my neighbor, so what do I do? I encourage them. I speak words of love and words of, of compassion, not words of condemnation nor words of gossip or words of judgment. But I love my neighbor, so I encourage them. I love my neighbor, so I forgive them. I love my neighbor, so I reach out to them. I love my neighbor, so I become friends with them. Yes, they might go to church, but that don't mean I can't go for a ride on Skidoo. Don't mean I can't help them pack in some food. Don't mean I can't bake a loaf of bread. Don't mean we can't get together and have a coffee. I love my neighbor, so I become friends with my neighbor. So there has to be action. Love is an action word. Love means, you know what? Getting involved. Getting involved. Mm. Verse number 33 of our text said, But the Samaritan, as he traveled, came to where the man was. Oh, he got involved. And when he saw him, he took pity on him. There was others that walked by. But when this Samaritan saw the man bleeding and dying on Jericho's road, he stopped and he got involved in the situation. Change the man's life because love changes circumstances and changes the lives of men and women. Love means getting involved. Even sometimes when it's inconvenient, even sometimes when you're not quite agreeing with what's going on, but love means getting involved, showing love and compassion and mercy and being there. Yeah, Luke chapter 10, and he answered, Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your strength, with all of your mind, meaning love the Lord your God with everything you got within you. It is an action word. I can't just love God on Sunday, and I can't just love God on Tuesday evening in the prayer meeting, but I gotta love God Monday and Wednesday and Thursday and Friday and Saturday as well. I gotta love God with everything that's within me. Hallelujah. Give it all to God. Love the Lord my God with all of my heart. Amen. With everything that's within me. Because love is action. God loved us. God gave of his own son for us. The love of God is a love that gives. And he gave all that could be given. So that we could be free and be saved. He gave of himself. And then he changed our lives. And because he changed our lives. We will follow him. <laughs> yes that means action on my part. It means getting out of my comfort zone at times. It means getting involved in the work of the church. It means loving. It means following. It means being obedient to the word of God. If you love me, Jesus says, then keep my commands. Can't make it much clearer than that, can you, Lord? If you love me, then keep my commands. We just read a couple of them that we would love each other. That's a command. But there are many others as well. But you call yourself a lover of Jesus Christ, a born-again believer of Jesus Christ, then follow the commands of the Lord. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your strength, with everything within you. A new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you. And so you must love one another. Amen. How has the Lord loved Amen. you? Well, take how he has loved you and apply that to how you love your neighbor, how you love those around you. Hallelujah. Praise God. Amen. There we go. Love is in action. The Samaritan was busy. He was busy. On his way. But he took time. He had pity on this man. He got involved in the situation. Jesus does the same thing for you and the same thing for me. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the Creator of all things, but He took time to reach into your life and into your situation. He was concerned about where you were and the life that you were living, and He revealed Himself unto you, and He took time for you because He loved you and because He cared about you. We're going to conclude with one more story in the Scripture found in Mark chapter number 10. It's an interesting story. 
But he teaches some, us something about love and true love. And he's getting involved. Like Mark chapter 10 verse 46 says, musicians get ready to return and pick a course for us to sing. It says, then they came to Jericho. And as Jesus and his disciples, together with a large crowd, were leaving the city, blind man Bartimaeus was sitting by the roadside begging. So you got this man who is blind, he can't do nothing about the situation, he can't change the situation. Jesus is busy, there's large crowds around him, and he's on a mission, he's passing through that way. And when he, Bartimaeus, heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout, Jesus, Son of David, have mercy on him. And so he begins to cry out to the Lord. Who is Bartimaeus? The Lord's busy. The Lord got all these people around him, all these miracles to do, and all this work to do. Who is Bartimaeus? But a blind beggar. He's crying out to the Lord, have mercy. And you know what? Many rebuked him, told him to be quiet, but he shouted all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. And there's those that would tell you that to be quiet, but I tell you, cry out on the Lord louder and louder and louder. Keep crying out until you receive the mercy and the answer that you need. So Jesus stopped. Some told him to be quiet, but he kept crying out. Jesus stopped and said, Call him. So they called to the blind man, Cheer up on your feet. He, meaning Jesus, is calling you. And then the scripture says, throwing his cloak aside, he jumped to his feet, and he came to Jesus. What do you want me to do for you? Jesus asked him. The blind man said, Rabbi, I want to see. I want to see. Nobody can help me. Nobody can do anything for me. Rabbi, Jesus, Son of God, I want to see. Was the Lord too busy to touch him? Was the Lord too busy to meet his need? Go, go, said Jesus. Your faith has healed you. And immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus along the road. You see, Jesus took time for Bartimaeus. Jesus took time for you. Jesus took time for me, for the one that's watching tonight, or maybe in this sanctuary tonight. Now I want you to understand that Jesus Christ has time for you. He is concerned about you. He wants to come in your life. He wants to show you His love. He wants to offer unto you His valentine. What is His valentine? His valentine is forgiveness. His grace. His mercy. His newness of life. For the Son of Man. For Jesus Christ came to seek and to save the lost. The truth is when I was lost in sin doing the things I was doing. He was seeking after me. And He was pursuing after me. He was desiring to get involved in my life. And he desires to do the same in your life tonight. He desires to bring the peace that, that only he can bring. To bring the hope that only he can bring. Because love means getting involved. You want to know something? Jesus loves you. He wants to get involved. He wants to get involved in your life. In your situation. Maybe there's things that need to be cleaned up. Maybe there's deliverances. Maybe there's addictions. I don't know. But I know this, that Jesus wants to get involved. And when he gets involved, oh, it brings a change. Amen. His love brings a change. Oh, praise God. A new command I give you. Love one another. Love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. Carry each other's burdens. And in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. I am to love you, you are to love me. We are to love our neighbors because God, because God has changed us and he loves us and he got involved in our hearts and he got involved in our lives, amen. And he desires to do the same thing for you and for our neighbors and for our families and for the use of whatever will. I love that about the Lord. I love that about our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. For God, for God, for God so loved the world Men, women, young, old, yes, rich, amen. poor, educated, amen. uneducated, Baptist, Anglican, Pentecostal, Salvation Army, Catholic, didn't make those differences. Amen. For God so the world that He gave His only begotten yes. Son. Amen. He loves you tonight. He's concerned about you tonight. Amen. The love of God. On this Valentine's Friday evening service, uh, there's nothing better I can preach to you than the love of God. And the love of of God. Hallelujah. Amen. We're going to stand together. Hallelujah. Pastor Lord is going to lead us in a course. Maybe there's somebody at home. Maybe there's somebody here tonight. You need to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You're outside of faith. 
you're outside of relationship, we want to give you that opportunity tonight to accept the greatest love story that has ever been told, the greatest valentine that has ever been given. You might accept the love story of God, the fact that He gave His one and only Son, and you would accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and as your Savior, and it would change your life the same way that it changed my life, and the same way that it changed our lives. Amen. It's real. It's real. And Jesus can do for you what nobody else can do. Bring a peace that only He can bring. Bring a hope that only He can bring. It's only Him that is able to lift the condemnation. It's only Him that is able to lift the guilt and the burden of sin. It is only Him that is able to wash and cleanse you. Amen. And make you righteous in the eyes of the Holy God. Amen. We invite you to come tonight. I'm going to lead in a prayer in a few moments, but we're going to open the altar. If you need to come and accept Jesus Christ, we invite you to do that. Stand with me, church, as Pastor Lenora leads us in a course.
maybe you feel like nobody loves you, but you've heard this message and you felt the tug of the Holy Spirit and, and you realize, yes, Jesus does love me. I want to give you the opportunity to accept Him as your Lord and as your Savior before we dismiss the online audience tonight. So let's bow together, church. If that's you tonight, if you're outside of faith or outside of relationship, repeat this prayer with me. Ask Jesus to become your Lord and to become your Savior. Amen. We love you here at Grace Pentecostal Church. That's why we're posting these services on Facebook and YouTube. But more importantly, Jesus loves you. He cares about you. And He's able to redeem you. Able to save you. Able to give you hope. Let's bow together. Church, every eye closed, every head bowed. Repeat after me. Lord Jesus, I believe you are the Son of God. I believe you died on the cross and rose from the dead. I believe you died for my sins. I ask you now to come into my life and forgive me of all of my sins. I place from this moment on that I will follow you. In Jesus' name. Amen. If you prayed that prayer tonight and you become a believer in Jesus Christ, a born again believer in Jesus Christ, Scripture says your sins are forgiven you. You're like a babe in Christ, so now you need to learn and grow and mature in your faith. You need to find a church where you can worship. Amen. Get connected to a local church. Very important in your spiritual growth. Amen. We want to thank you for tuning in, watching, and joining us. I encourage you to do so this coming Sunday. And next Friday evening as well, if the Lord tarries, we'll again be posting our service. Amen. Online. God bless you.